And we are live. It's Dr. J here in the house. We have Evan Brand here as well. Today's going to be an exciting topic. We're going to be chatting about hair loss and how to naturally regrow your hair. So really excited about this topic. Evan, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. We were just digging through some research before we jumped on here. And it turns out there's a lot of stuff that people are doing that's contributing to their hair loss. And then people go to their doctor and the doctors don't know the stuff that we're about to tell you. Like all these different medications that we found that have been linked to hair loss and tons of people, like the vast majority mm -hmm. of Americans are on one or multiple of these different uh, medications. So why don't we just start right. there talking about drugs because people love drugs. America is like the land of pharmaceuticals compared to other countries. So why don't we go down this list real quick of any medication that could be contributing to your hair thinning or hair loss? Yeah, that's definitely the low hanging fruit because if you're on a medication, we already know the side effects are already documented. It's not really that controversial. It just may not be talked about. So let's bring that to the forefront. Go ahead. All right. So I'm just going to run through the list here. And if you want to go further into these, we can, but acne sure. medications, antibiotics, antidepressants, antifungal medications, blood thinners, chemotherapy, of course, cholesterol lowering medications, epilepsy medications, high blood pressure medications, mm -hmm. hormone replacement therapy, immunosuppressants, interferons, mood stabilizers, NSAIDs, oral contraceptives, Parkinson's disease medications, steroids, thyroid medications. That's basically every drug that people use. I mean, that's like all of them. So if you're on any of those and you have hair loss and you're complaining about your hair loss, that's the first place to start. 100%, 100%. So let's kind of just dive in and just talk about a couple of simple mechanisms that could be at the root. Because we have foundational things that can be done. And then we have more nuanced things. So it's like when you build a house, you know, you may not be worried about picking out the crown molding and the fancy tile that you're going to use in your master bedroom, when we haven't even laid out the foundation yet. So let's start at the foundational principles. So first thing is going to be just generally inflammation. Why is inflammation one sec. Why is inflammation important? So when we have excess inflammation, that's going to cause our cells and our tissue to break down faster than we build up. Okay, that's big. And the big vectors of inflammation are going to come from physical sources, chemical sources, and emotional sources. And all of these stressors interplay on our hormones, on our gut, on our immune system. And then of course, if we're driving inflammation via nutritional means, nutritional kind of fits into that chemical category, right? Chemical could be heavy metals, mold. It could be inflammatory foods like gluten and refined sugar. It could be hormonal imbalances, female thyroid. It could be autoimmune issues, leaky gut, gluten sensitivity. So a lot of things kind of fit into that chemical stressor bucket. Of course, the emotional stress is a big thing. A lot of people have had experiences with like maybe, you know, death of a loved one and you start losing hair and there's, there's that, or you're over exercising, right? You see it in women, they over exercise, they may lose their period, their hair starts thinning, they start getting colder. So a lot of those symptoms are common on the emotional side, common on the physical side. We're going to go into the more nuanced chemical stressor. So of course, if we're not getting enough nutrition to build our hair, that's numero uno. So essential fatty acids, right? Uh, healthy amino acids, these the fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, selenium, zinc, magnesium, these are important building biotin or B7, right? These are very important building block nutrients. So the first thing is if we're eating kind of a paleo template, it's automatically going to be nutrient dense, low in toxin and anti-inflammatory. We may adjust the macronutrients, protein, fat and carbs according to what you need, but every bite of food is going to be anti-inflammatory, nutrient-dense, and low in toxin. Low in toxin being organic. You're not getting um, pesticides. You're not getting Roundup, glyphosate. Remember, glyphosate is a chemical chelator, so it'll pull out zinc. It'll pull out important minerals, selenium, that are important for hair growth. The catalase enzyme is really important for hair growth and hair color, and that's a glutathione-based enzyme. And we need selenium for glutathione. And if you're eating your plants that are grown in depleted soils because of pesticides and Roundup, that can easily deplete some of these nutrients. So just highlighting the nutrients is going to be healthy proteins, healthy fats, um, vitamin A, fat-soluble vitamins, uh, your selenium, your zinc, very important for hair. 
uh, and also skin and nails tend to connect with that. And then the next thing I would say is, okay, great, you're eating these things. Now we have to be able to digest them. We have to have enough hydrochloric acid and enzymes and enough gut integrity to be able to break everything down. So that's kind of foundation. I'll let you comment, Evan. Yeah, you may need to go more strict with diet. We may need to go more autoimmune paleo if this is like an alopecia type situation where you've had maybe a family history of uh, immune system issues. Correct. But when you, when you have alopecia, you know, you, you could potentially lose everything. I mean, it could literally be your eyebrows, your eyelashes. I mean, every hair on your body could disappear. So if you're in that bad of shape and we've had those alopecia cases before, we got to go with an autoimmune paleo template. I'm so glad you brought up the point about glyphosate being a chelator. I don't think many people discuss the fact that it's pulling minerals out. That's, that's huge because you could be on a paleo diet, but if you're still getting exposed to a lot of chemical toxins, like let's say you do like some meal prep service and they do sweet potatoes and strawberries and those are not organic, but they're still quote paleo because they're real food. The average sweet potato has 20 plus pesticides. The average strawberry, 22 pesticides and herbicides in it. And so you're actually doing more damage to yourself by doing those foods, even though it's quote real food, if it's chemical, it's just not worth it. So really, really, really focus on organic. This is key. I looked at the price difference. People complain, oh, you got to be rich to eat organic at Whole Foods. I've seen a pound of strawberries for $2.99, which is chemical conventional garbage. Organic was $3.99 for the same size. It was $1 more. And that extra dollar is going to provide you more nutrient density, more trace minerals. You're not going to be getting genetically modified things. And you're saving your gut because we know that glyphosate is damaging your gut bacteria too. So you and I are going to talk about that today. You're already giving us the preface talking about stomach acid levels. If you're damaging your gut bacteria by consuming pesticide foods, now you have bacterial overgrowth and that bacterial overgrowth prevents you from digesting your food. And then you don't have enough of those raw nutrients to build your hair. So the whole domino effect can fall apart just by you not doing enough organic, which sounds crazy, but it's true. 100%. And just, you know, off the bat, I was a, a poor doctoral student for a long time. Um, being in school in San Francisco, California, which is obviously one of the most expensive places to live. I think I was living on like 15 or $16,000 a year for financial aid, which anyone knows the poverty level in San Francisco is like 80 grand a year. So I was like living maybe six or seven times below the poverty level. And I just had a really strict budget. So I had a budget, I would spend 75 to $80 a week on food. And I would get a lot of my vegetables would be frozen organic. I would do some, you know, fresh spinach or fresh leafy greens that were organic that would, you know, $5, dollars you get a big thing. And then a lot of my meats, I would just do free ranger or Grass fed was a little bit too expensive, but I could do something at four or five dollars a pound. And because Amazon's bought Whole Foods, some of their grass fed meat is under that price now. So you actually have better quality now. I would do a lot of chicken thighs, which would be very helpful. I would do a lot of skipjack tuna, which is you know pretty good because the selenium to mercury ratio and that's really good. And then I would do more free range eggs. I wouldn't quite get organic. So if you don't, if you're not all the way on the organic, try to at least be hormone free, antibiotic free if you can't quite get the pasture fed grass fed. So there is an in-between, it's not an all or nothing. So do your best just to make sure the foods are nutrient dense and anti-inflammatory, and then try to see if we can at least get an in-between quality. Maybe you go organic on the frozen vegetables, you get some fresh vegetables that are organic, you do some fish, you try to get some wild Alaskan sockeye frozen, maybe you go to Costco to get some stuff there, and then try to choose chicken thigh skin on over like a breast or um, any of the more expensive cuts, you know, stay away from the big steaks, ribeye, filet, those things, but you can at least do ground meat. You can at least do tuna fish. You can at least do um, ch uh, chicken thighs, skin on. Those are really good starting points. And I've done it. <laughs> I did that for four or five years. So I understand it. And I hope that helps. And people go to Hardee's and they'll go get like a double cheeseburger with fries and a large Coke. And it's like seven ninety nine. So you take two people going to get a fast food meal. Yep. That's six, that's 16 bucks. 100%. You could go to Whole Foods and you get an already cooked organic rotisserie chicken for eight or nine dollars. And let's say you buy at the salad bar, you get like a cup full of organic blueberries. That's maybe a buck or two. And then maybe you buy a bag of like Siete cassava chips for yep. like four bucks your total meal is like 16 dollars for two people and the food nutrient density was way better than the hardy 7.99 double cheeseburger with fries and a large coke 
hundred percent. My goal when I was a poor doctoral student was always to get my meal below $5 total. If I could get it under five, then I am doing better than going to a fast food restaurant, right? That's kind of where I was at. Plus I'm getting a lot better nutrition. So yeah. just kind of people out there that are struggling with that, just make the priority. It's got to be a priority. Number one, you got to see the value in it. Number two, junk foods artificially cheap because our government subsidizes soy and, and corn and wheat. So it's artificially cheaper. You're not really paying the real cost of it. And then number three is um, we got to look at what we're eating as the quality components are really important. You can't just eat it and think it's good. The quality has to be there too. So that's the food component. Next, let's dive into hormones. So hormones are vitally important. So the first thing is if we consume too much carbs or too much refined sugar, insulin resistance is going to be a key, key problem with hair issues. So one of the first things insulin is going to do is you're going to be depleting more minerals that run your energy cycles, your Krebs cycle, your mitochondria when your blood sugar is higher because that Krebs cycle then has to run and it requires amino acids, magnesium, minerals to help run it. So that's number one. So you're going to deplete a lot of those nutrients when you eat more sugar. So then it's like using a credit card, but you don't pay the bill. So then your next month's bill is higher because of the interest you have to pay. It's kind of like that. And so when you have a high levels of insulin, certain enzymes are going to be upregulated. So as a guy, you're going to upregulate an enzyme called aromatase, and that enzyme will cause problems with your testosterone, having it convert downstream to estrogen. And when estrogen goes downstream, you start to upregulate enzymes called 5-alpha dehydrox, uh, 5-alpha, 5-alpha uh, D dihydrotestosterone. So the 5-alpha reductase is the enzyme. And that enzyme is important from testosterone going to testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. So dihydrotestosterone is the stronger testosterone and that can is associated with causing hair loss okay that's what a lot of these medications the um finasterides they block that enzyme the 5 alpha reductase enzyme they block it now there are natural things that block it too really important ones are zinc and selenium also are natural 5 alpha reductase inhibitors so what happens is this here's the mechanism we have high levels of insulin from too much carbs too much sugar that high level of insulin starts to upregulate aromatase. Aromatase causes testosterone to start going to estrogen. As testosterone goes to estrogen, testosterone starts to drop and our body starts freaking out and it makes this stronger testosterone called dihydrotestosterone, DHT for short, DHT starts going up. And the enzyme that goes from testosterone to DHT is the 5-alpha reductase enzyme. And as your diet becomes poor and nutrients drop, the minerals that help regulate that enzyme, selenium and zinc, start going low, which starts to increase a DHT more. So you can see low selenium, low zinc, more, right? More dihydrotestosterone as those minerals are the break that prevents that DHT or dihydrotestosterone from going up. And that DHT is associated <clears throat> with decreasing blood flow to the hair follicles. So insulin is a big, big component with raising DHT, raising estrogen in men, and lowering testosterone. So that's one component there. Um, you're also going to see it in women as well. You'll see it with testosterone, you're actually gonna see different things. You'll see ovarian cysts start to form in women and you'll start seeing more hair growth and you can start seeing hair loss on the head. When you start having excess cortisol surges, especially in women and in men, you can start losing hair there as well. So you can see it with high cortisol, you can see it with high insulin, and then high insulin in women increases testosterone, high insulin in men, decreases testosterone and increases DHT. So the, there, it's a little bit switched for men and women. So I know it's hard to kind of wrap your head around that. So you may have to listen to it twice. So I'll say it one more time. Women, high levels of insulin, increased testosterone, increased cortisol, hair loss from the high cortisol. Men, increase insulin. You're gonna have increase in aromatase. Aromatase is gonna decrease testosterone, increase estrogen, and then DHT, the stronger testosterone starts to go up, that pinches blood flow off to the hair follicles, hair loss start to occur. So that's one major mechanism. Well said. That was very, very clear. Crazy how you would think, oh, this 
high fructose corn syrup soda. You know, this is just bad because it's sugar, but you don't think, wow, I could be messing up my hair by drinking a soda. And so when we talk about herbs, we'll get into that soon. I do want to hit on the gut though. Are you ready to talk about the gut? Let's do it. Let's hit it. Okay. So I'll, I'll go on a little bit of a rant about the gut. Just because I've seen so many cool things happen with men and women that have had hair loss issues. Um, You mentioned earlier it was connected to the skin and to the nails too, which is huge because that was an indicator that my gut was messed up or my fingernails. Mm -hmm. Correct. So you can look at your fingernails. If you're seeing vertical ridges, vertical lines, you've got real brittle nails. The quality of your nails is not good. You've got skin issues. Then you probably have gut issues. And so obviously if you're working with us one-on-one, we would be doing functional testing on you to look at your urine and look at your stool to investigate and find roll in or roll out various infections that are affecting digestion like H. pylori, which reduces stomach acid, then your food doesn't digest, then you can't get these nutrients that Justin's talking about to fuel these pathways for optimal hair growth. Then you got other bacterial overgrowth, you've got candida, you've got parasites, you've got worms, all these issues in the gut can totally affect digestion, which long story short affects the hair. So you've got to get the data and don't just guess, don't just go and take like olive leaf because you read olive leaves good for candida or, you know, Saccharomyces boulardii. Yeah, those are cool, but you want to know what you're up against first. So we really like you to get the data because you could go and take a probiotic and feel worse and don't know why. And you say, oh, well, I heard probiotics are good for my gut. And you said the gut is why I'm, I'm having hair loss. It's not that easy. You, you might find that probiotics make you worse. You may get bloated or you may feel bad. So get your functional medicine testing done first, and then you can make the order of operations. Well, I've got these infections. So first I need to work on getting rid of bad guys before I go into doing probiotic replenishment later. So that's really all I have to say about the gut is that it's huge, but you have to get the data because if you don't know what you're up against, we literally can't just say, here's a supplement for your gut, like aloe vera extract. Yeah, maybe that reduces inflammation in the gut, but it's not root cause. 100%. All of the important nutrients that we talked about from a dietary perspective and how the nutrient density and also the food quality affects the nutrient density, that is important, but above and beyond, we have to be able to digest that. So if we're not breaking it down, digesting, assimilating, absorbing, and utilizing, then that just everything goes south from there. So 100%. We talked about the hormone issues. Now in women, if we start going more into menopause, late 40s, early 50s, estrogen and progesterone start dropping, that can definitely influence hair as well. We start to see more skin dryness, hair quality, those type of like connective tissue things start to decrease as women go into menopause. We see more wrinkles increase, we see more libido issues, and then of course the hair is gonna be part of that connective tissue cascade. So we have to make sure if we're going into menopause, we're supporting the adrenals and we're supporting those hormone pathways to a, to a place of balance. So that's gonna be different for every person. So if you're a female in that you know late 40s, early 50s, and that's happening to you, or even if you're postmenopausal in your 50s, 60s, or 70s, you really wanna find a good functional medicine doctor that can work on your hormone balance. But it's really important that you look at the adrenals because as those ovaries start to drop, those follicles start getting depleted, your adrenals are gonna be utilized a lot more to fill in the gap where those hormones from the ovaries are not. So that's really important is the adrenals. The second thing, and this affects men and women equally, but women five times more, is gonna be thyroid issues. So low thyroid or hypothyroid or Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune attack to the thyroid that causes low thyroid function, is important because we know thyroid hormone is really important for follicle growth. And if we don't have enough thyroid hormone, we're not gonna have that, that milieu to cause healthy follicles to grow and that can cause hair loss too. And you may also see eyebrow thinning, which is a patented low thyroid symptom. So outer third of the eyebrow thinning. You may also see cold hands, cold feet, constipation, mood issues, depression, anxiety. So typically there's not just hair as being an isolated symptom. You're gonna have hair issues and a whole bunch of other cascade of symptoms as well. So thyroid's really important. Now, it may be as simple as getting on a bioidentical thyroid support and that can fix it. Most thyroid issues are autoimmune. So typically you're gonna have to fix the autoimmune attack. And we may use certain herbs and nutrients and and diet changes like an autoimmune template. We may use natural anti-inflammatory compounds to help modulate the immune system like curcumin or glutathione. 
the enzymes that are really important for hair growth and hair color are catalase enzymes. And these enzymes are strongly connected to glutathione. And it's interesting because selenium is a really powerful glutathione building block, but selenium is also really important for hair color and hair growth, but it's also really important for thyroid conversion. And it's also really important for helping to decrease thyroid inflammation when there's autoimmunity. So it's amazing how so many of these things kind of dovetail. And a lot of people are taking synthetic thyroid medications, which Evan mentioned have side effects of hair loss. So the first thing is look at those medications. Number two, if you're on a conventional thyroid medication, you really want to look at the full hormone cascade, TSH, T4 for T4 free, T3 free, reverse T3, TPO, thyroglobin antibodies. You may even want to throw in T4 total and T3 total as well because you may not be converting T4 to T3. You still may have very high amount of antibodies. You may have high amount of reverse T3, which tells me there's adrenal stress. So there could be other things in this whole cascade and you really want to zoom out and get a complete picture. And we may need to have a natural thyroid support that actually has T3 in it. That can help. So I'll kind of leave it there. I've seen that. I've seen that where women have switched over from like a Synthroid over to sometimes just a Cytomel, just a straight T3. And sometimes that's enough. Or we get them over to like an Acela, like an NP thyroid, Nature Throid. There's a couple um, that you and I have used like um, Thyroid Gold, which is a desiccated thyroid. And I've heard massive, massive improvements just on that just based on that. Also anemia, you know, that's kind of a low hanging fruit that we haven't Mm -hmm. mentioned. Why don't we talk about anemia real quick? Just because, you know, a lot of women that have come to us have had uh, different issues with their menstrual cycle. Maybe they're heavy bleeders or they're having long cycles. And if these women are now uh, postmenopausal, they don't have a cycle anymore. All the terrible hormone issues they had They didn't just magically disappear just because they don't have a cycle. Those lasting effects of anemias could still be a a big factor. 100%. So when we talk about various things or nutrients, I don't want you to just think of the nutrient and say, just take it. I want you to go upstream and think about the mechanism because the nutrient being helpful or not, that's downstream, right? The root cause and the mechanism is upstream. So Iron's really important. Why? Because iron binds the hemoglobin to help you carry oxygen. Why is oxygen important? Well, because oxygen helps with aerobic metabolism. And part of the reason why, let's say, DHT is harmful for men is because DHT can decrease blood flow to hair follicles. What happens when there's decreased blood flow? Decrease oxygen. So you can see how some of these mechanisms, when you look at iron, low iron, especially in women, why women? Because women can menstruate, guys don't. When they menstruate, they have their periods, they lose blood there. So if you're estrogen dominant, and you're losing a lot of blood, there's another hormonal mechanism. You lose a lot of blood, you have low iron, low iron, not enough healthy um, oxygen carrying capacity, not enough healthy oxygen capacity going to the hair follicle. Not That's important for healthy hair generation, right? You, you choke out the hair, you don't give it enough blood flow and oxygen, it's gonna die, right? So there's that mechanism. Two is we could be v- vegan or vegetarian and not getting enough high quality heme based iron right? We can't just base it off of, you know, spinach. We actually, even though spinach is high in iron, we need actual animal products to get good quality iron in there. And then number three, there could be a lot of malabsorption. So I see a lot of patients that have a lot of gut inflammation. It could be autoimmune where there's an irritable bowel disease like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. It could be something in between where there's a gluten sensitivity issue or some kind of an IBS or some kind of just low grade gastritis or gut inflammation. And they're not breaking down the nutrition adequate. And then they're not getting enough of their animal products broken down. So those are the three big mechanisms when it comes to iron. Yeah. So when we do blood work, we would want to look at a marker called ferritin. It's an iron storage protein. When women start to get down to like a 20 or a 30 with ferritin, number one, there's going to be a lot of hair loss. But number two, these women may complain that they can't catch their breath. Like they'll go up a flight of stairs and they're just like, oh, I can't breathe. Like I can't catch their breath. And that's exactly what you talked about. There's just, it's, it's, it's a starvation. You're starving from not enough oxygen. So when we really want to get to optimal hair growth levels, the ferritin is usually going to be somewhere like 90. And I believe it's like NG nanograms over deciliter, NG over DL. I believe that's the normal reference range. Either way, regardless of whether you're 
in US or somewhere else that uses a different reference range. You want to be on the upper end of the reference range for ferritin. You don't want to be just at the low end. And a doctor's going to miss that. They may look at ferritin and say 30 is fine, but 30 is not optimal. Yeah, at least 30, ideally above 40. We may want to look at iron serum to make sure it's more mid reference range. We also want to look at iron saturation, make sure it's at least 25. We can also look at TIBC and UIBC binding proteins, those actually go high when iron goes low, so somewhat in the middle. High doesn't mean necessarily good when it comes to those binding proteins because they're kind of on the reverse side. Um, so that's really important. But again, we want to look at the root cause. And vegans and vegetarians definitely are going to have a harder time with that. If it's really important that you be vegan and vegetarian, well, I would, I would advise having some level of protein in there or animal protein, at least maybe liver capsules, if you could, if you can wrap your head around doing liver capsules. There are some vegan vegetarian iron sources that are decent. One's called Flora Vital or Flora Dix. It's a German herbal product that's been around for about 100 years. Flora Vital is the gluten-free source of that. So if you, that's really important that you maintain glu, um, a vegan status or vegetarian status, that's at least one good option. I always try to at least push for at least the liver capsules. Hey, you're not tasting it. Maybe you can wrap your head around it. So that's a good source right there off the bat. Good idea. Good idea. I'm glad you're putting solutions because I like to make fun of vegans and say, hey, what you're doing is not sustainable. Quit doing it. But I like that you put in a sustainable idea. Yeah. I mean, hey, it's like I'm, I'm real. Like my first goal was getting you a result. Um, that's number one. So if, if you're fully on board with what I'm saying, or you still want to be on board, is there a middle kind of road, right? So that's at least the middle of the road thing. The second thing we already highlighted, and some of these things, there's going to be tips here that people listening can just do on their own. That's great. And there are going to be some tips that you're going to really need a, a good skill of practitioner, like looking at the gut, making sure there's no infections like candida or H. pylori that could be affecting absorption. Also looking at gut permeability or looking at parasitic infections that could be creating more gut stress, right? Making sure these nutrients are being absorbed. We may run nutrient panels, whether it's an ion panel or a nutrient eval or a spectrocell. We may see some of these intercellular nutrients are very low. We may want to support them as well, right? But we're going to support them in conjunction with, hey, why are we low to begin with? Is it just a poor diet thing? Is it a hormone thing? Is it a gut thing? So we may use palliative support with the focus still being on the upstream root cause. Makes sense. And there's different multivitamins, like for the hair, skin, nails that we can use. We could throw in collagen, peptides. We could throw in like saw palmetto, which helps to block the DHT. You could throw in like pumpkin seeds. I've read pumpkin seeds can help with the DHT by blocking the binding sites. Um, fish oil could be a good anti-inflammatory, adaptogenic herbs supporting adrenals like we talked about aloe for reducing inflammation in your gut, Um, zinc, you mentioned that, selenium. So there are supplements you can throw in, but I just want to point out that this whole way of thinking, which hopefully you all are adopting this by listening to Justin and I over and over and over again, which is the fact that you're going to find a symptom or a complaint like hair loss. Okay. So you'll, you'll come to us and you'll say, Oh my, my, I, I want to lose weight and I'm losing too much hair like very, I'm not going to say they're vain, but I'm going to say they're very like vanity based. Like, okay, you really care about your hair and you care about your weight. But then after we do all the diagnostics and we pull all these labs out and put them in front of you, we're actually showing you, Hey, look, really what you should care about is look at your mitochondrial function. It's not good. Look at your gut inflammation. It's really high. Look at your nutrient absorption. We're assuming it's low based on how low you are in these amino acids. Look at your neurotransmitters. Your brain chemistry is burned out. Are you sure that you're not eating a chocolate bar every day? Oh, yeah, I am. I crave dark chocolate all the time. Oh, okay, so your endorphins are burned out and your adrenal hormones look like this and your vitamin D is too low and you've got anemia and you've got high insulin and your A1C levels too high and you've got this parasite and you've got this bacterial overgrowth and oh, you have some candida too. And oh, look, you're deficient in all these trace minerals and you've got some thyroid antibodies. So when we really pull all that other stuff out, it's like, okay, here's what you really should care about. And you have to fix all of this to work to fix that one goal of, hey, I'm losing too much hair and I want to lose 10 pounds. So I just, it's, it's, it's a whole nother way of thinking, but it is like the best way to approach these issues. 
Exactly. I want people to walk away from our podcast, not with just random factoids, but with a new perspective on how to think. If I can get people to think better when they come to a conclusion or an understanding of something, they're going to be able to understand you know, how they got there, what the mechanism is. When you understand the mechanism, you don't ever, you don't, you don't forget. It's locked, right? If you understand a concept versus memorizing a fact, the concept sticks forever. So that's really important. So let's go look at one. There's a common supplement out there. It's called Nutrafol. I just want to break people um, kind of mindset down so they can understand why that product may work. What is it? How do you spell this? N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L, Nutrafol.com. Now, I've seen it help some patients. I've seen it not. We use a lot of these ingredients, Evan, in our supplements already. So if you're a patient working with me, we typically use a lot of these nutrients anyway in different formulas that we have. But here's just one product. Let me walk you through the thinking. So the first ingredient is tocotrienols. What's that? That's vitamin E, right? Where does vitamin E fit in? Vitamin E is a fat-soluble vitamin. So we already talked about how fat-soluble vitamins, especially vitamin A, D, E, and K, which you're going to get in healthy animal products is going to be very helpful. We may supplement it as well. It's in my multi-support pack. It's, we have a full spectrum um, to cough or all complex in there. So vitamin E is important. Next one, ashwagandha. Why is that important? Well, if you remember the hormonal mechanism we talked about earlier, cortisol and stress is really important. Ashwagandha has various glycoloids, which help with the HPA access, the pituitary adrenal feedback loop to the adrenals, and it can help kind of curtail high amounts of cortisol. It can help curtail stress perception. The less you perceive stress, the less stress hormone you make, the more you feel relaxed, et cetera. It's a self-defeating cycle. So ashwagandha can help break that up. Third is curcumin. Why curcumin? We talked about curcumin is a natural anti-inflammatory. Earlier, we mentioned how inflammation does what? it decreases blood flow. So when we decrease inflammation, we can help improve blood flow and we can help improve oxygenation. Next, saw palmetto. Why saw palmetto important? Remember earlier we talked about blood sugar and we talked about high amounts of insulin, upregulate aromatase, aromatase in men, it's gonna decrease testosterone, increase estrogen, and then it increases this hormone called DHT, dihydrotestosterone. That inhibitor, that enzyme that goes from testosterone to DHT, that's 5-alpha reductase. That enzyme is going to be down-regulated with saw palmetto. So saw palmetto is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. It's a little bit more gentle than like a lot of the um, finasterides, right? Finasterides can decrease that enzyme as well, but there's also a lot of symptoms associated with that. So like Rogaine, Minoxidil, Flomax, a lot of these are like um, finasterides and they can decrease that enzyme, but there's also, you can just Google post-finasteride syndrome. So there is some of those medications we gotta be careful of, all right? Next is gonna be marine collagen. Oh, let me back up. So saw palmetto is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. Great. So is zinc, so is selenium, right? So there's other nutrients that can be used outside of saw palmetto to down-regulate that enzyme. Fifth is collagen. I use collagen all the time. Collagen is really important. I have a product called True Collagen. Why do I like it? We don't get enough connective tissue amino acids in our diet. Connective tissues are bone broth, right? Most people aren't making foods where they're putting the, all the bones, everything in there. And when you do a nice soup, you can extract a lot of those amino acids. People that aren't drinking bone broth may not get enough good collagen amino acids. These collagen amino acids are more connective tissue based, and they're going to have a lot of building blocks for good quality hair integrity. So just kind of walking people through my thinking, most people see this supplement and they're just like, oh, okay, great. Now you understand the deeper thinking. So I think these are some good things that can be used. I would also add biotin to that. I would also add things like horsetail. I would add in zinc. I would add selenium. I would add more vitamin A as well. These are other things that I would utilize in conjunction with that to help it be even better. It sounds like they've got really good marketing though. You promote this product for hair, hair wellness from within 88 bucks a bottle. I mean, they're making a lot of cash on that 88 bucks. Yep. It's definitely expensive. You can do these things. When we put them into our program, they're going to be cheaper because we're, we're doing them 
you know, it's not by itself. It's going to be part of an adrenal support. A lot of time we'll have some of those products in it. We may be using things like curcumin for, to, for inflammation regulation. We may be doing saw palmetto in a natural five alpha reductase enzyme formula, which will have more things. It'll have lycopene. It'll have pumpkin seed. It'll have more things than just that. So for sure. It is. It's funny though, isn't it? The world of supplement marketing, you know, you could market something for hair loss, but like you mentioned, you and I are already basically implementing this entire protocol of these different nutrients, just as part of our functional medicine philosophy of supporting hormones, restoring gut balance, uh, giving collagen, uh, reducing inflammation, but we don't market it as a hair loss protocol. We just make it a protocol to get you really healthy. And as a side effect of you getting really healthy, your hair grows. Yep. MSM is also great as well. That's a, a sulfur based kind of amino acid compound. That's really, really good. We already talked about saw palmetto, um, folate and B12 are also going to be really important. We already the mentioned thing. millennium and biotin being helpful. Go ahead. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention was we did look into the research on the low, they call it LLLT, low level laser or light therapy. Yep. And it does work. So you've seen, I've seen some of these ads on Facebook and other places where they'll promote these men or women wearing this crazy contraption looking like uh, Dr. Emmett Brown from Back to the Future. And he's got a bunch of like laser beams beaming his head to regrow hair. They do work. There, there are studies on this and it does appear within, I think it was a 16 week trial that I found. It was like a 655 nanometer laser. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so this, this is a six month study, a six month study, 55% increase in the women who did this 74% increase in men who did this. There was another double blind, uh, trial on a different type of laser for hair, 26 week trial. And they didn't give us a percentage. They just said significant hair density improvements were seen. So the lasers do work, but I don't want people to still eat McDonald's and just do a laser on their hair. And most people do that. Yeah, the, I think the major mechanism that lasers are going to work is number one, lasers tend to have stimulatory effects on the mitochondria. So that's going to be helpful. They're going to help reduce inflammation. So anytime you reduce inflammation, you increase blood flow and that's going to provide better nutrition. And then in and of itself, they're naturally going to stimulate blood flow as well. So if you get better blood flow, less inflammation, less inflammation helps blood flow, you stimulate the mitochondria, right? You provide stimulation to the cell. And then as long as the nutrition and all the other building blocks that are there and you reduce all the other internal stressors like the pesticides and all the junk in the diet, it could be more helpful from a root cause perspective, but it will definitely be palliative, but at least it's palliative without all the side effects of maybe a finasteride medication. True. We just don't want your average person who's eating a standard American diet going to Chick-fil-A drive through on a Saturday morning and shoving their uh, breakfast uh, sandwich with MSG, by the way, Chick-fil-A, they promote themselves as like higher quality fast food. There's MSG in all their products. Just look them up. Look up their sausage biscuit. It's got MSG. The eggs are fake. The chicken nuggets have MSG and other garbage, even dairies and a lot of their products. So, you go, oh, I'm going to go get my morning Starbucks, and then I'm going to Chick-fil-A, and I'm going to get my morning drive through you know, sausage, egg, and cheese biscuit, and then I'm going to go get my laser therapy. No, that's not – you're not thinking about it the right way. You got to do the other stuff, and I don't even know how much a laser costs. So get ditch the garbage fast food, get real food, and you'll probably save more money and not even need a laser. 100%. And there's also other things as well like a PRP injection, which is a platelet – uh, platelet rich plasma and also various stem cell injections that can be used in the scalp as well. Again, these are going to have really good, important building blocks and growth factors that will help stimulate the hair to grow, which I think is beneficial, but still it's going to be palliative. It will not fix the root cause mechanism. So if you're a guy and you're like, Hey, I really want to get my hair turned around. These are other options that I would look at, but make sure you have the foundation already dialed in because these procedures are expensive. So you, if you are going to go into it, you want to give it the highest chance of it working. Therefore, you want to get the cortisol in check, selenium, all the minerals, all the nutrients, make sure your hormones are good, make sure your gut's good, make sure your blood sugars are good. And that's going to give you the first best step. And I understand like if you're a guy and you're losing hair, you know, and, and you're trying a lot of these things, you know, some of these topical 
Rogaine or Minoxidil, some, they can be helpful. So if you're a guy coming in there, maybe a tiny amount of these things topically on, on that area versus taking it systemically like you would with kind of a Flomax med, maybe more beneficial. It's kind of like if someone had a skin infection, well, I think it'd be better to, to use an antibiotic cream than taking a whole systemic antibiotic in itself, right, orally. So you kind of have to figure out that. And again, if you're on the prescription side of the fence, make sure you talk to your prescribing doctor about that to adjust it so it's more specific and more localized versus doing a kind of systemic thing. Yep. Well said. That's great advice. And then of course, the last but not least thing is going to be a hair transplant. And again, the hair transplants have done, you know, they're much better today. There's less scarring. Uh, they're more exact in how they do it. And a lot of times they'll combine it with PRP or stem cells to help the hair grow even better. Big thing is though, if you're going to do it, definitely definitely, definitely, definitely do it with all the other conjunctions in effect. I mean, there's a lot of celebrities you can see that have definitely had hair loss and then their hair you can see has grown back a ton. I mean, for instance, Elon Musk, just look at his pictures in the late nineties. He was basically bald and look at his hair today. He's got a beautiful set of hair. Same with Matthew McConaughey, late nineties. Look, look at his mugshot online, right? Basically balding. Look at him today, beautiful head of hair. So some of these procedures do work combine them with all the other things that we're talking about. And then you got a winning team. Yep. Amen. Yeah. And that's going to be on the extreme side. I'd say most people, especially women, they're going to have a better chance because a lot of it's hormonal and gut based. There are some genes that will skip generations. The AR gene is a big one that can encode for androgen receptor protein. And these are the ones that are going to be really affected when free testosterone drops and that can have a significant effect on hair loss. And again, that's typically going to be on the mother's side. Usually it skips generation and it's on the mother's side. So that's the big genetic component there. So you're saying look at your grandma and if she balded, then you might bald? I think it's going to be your grandmother's dad. Ah, okay. Yeah. And that's the AR gene. But I've had some people where, you know, that didn't quite ring true. And then some people, um, it may just been a genetic predisposition. And let's say they did other things to combat that and maybe they were able to starve it off longer or have less. So, there, you know, it's not going to be, um, you know, something that happens right away. It's, it's not a guarantee, but it's definitely a strong, strong predisposition. And let's just say there's a more, let's just say sensitive environmental factors. If they're in a play, yeah, you're going to lose your hair, but you may be able to starve it off by doing all the things we talked about today. And that may give you the best possible chance of keeping your hair. And then that's where you'd want to look at some of these other more natural um, surgical type of things while doing all the foundational things too. Makes sense. I've had so many women that yeah. report on their follow-ups. Oh, I went to my hairdresser and they said, I'm growing so much more new hair. I was not intending to do that. I'm just fixing what I see. I'm working on the gut, the adrenals, like we talked about. So you and I really, we've become able to speak on this topic Correct. just from clinical experience. It's not like we took a course on how to regrow hair naturally. No, we just, we just help people improve their health. And as a side effect, the hair grows. So now we feel that we have enough information to share on this, but you know, when we're working with someone, we don't say, Hey, my goal is to help you grow more hair. I always tell them straight up, my goal is to fix your gut and all these other issues I see. And you're probably going to grow more hair as a side effect of getting healthy. A lot of these superficial type of goals or symptoms, which are, they're still important, they're all downstream, right? Yeah. When the gut gets better and all these root cause upstream things happen, right? It's always top down, inside out, right? You work inside out, top down. And a lot of these things are in the downward kind of manifestation. So if we go inside out, top down, we're going to fix a lot of these things downstream. So I think it's really important. And if people are listening to this and they're like, all right, Dr. Jane Evan just listed out a whole bunch of like mechanisms and a lot of science, like I'm overwhelmed. Like what the heck do I do? All right, let me break it down. So number one, if your issues are severe and hair loss is just one thing out of many, you really got to find a good functional medicine doctor. We're available, evanbrand.com, justinhealth.com, number one. Number two, what can you take action on right away? Uh, cut grains out of your diet, right? Cut, you know, go on a paleo or at least an autoimmune paleo template. Number two, get adequate amount of selenium and zinc. What does that look like? At least 200 micrograms supplemented through, um, through um, selenium and 30 milligrams supplemented through zinc. So 200 micrograms of selenium, 30 milligrams of zinc, different metrics there. It's what people not be dialed, you know, make sure they recall that, uh, get enough collagen in your diet. What does that look like? That could be about 30 grams a day, maybe 40 or 50. If we have hair loss issues, that's going to give you extra building blocks. 
And then we could also use extra vitamin A, extra fish oil, extra vitamin E. These are good low hanging fruit to kind of start off with. One, they're nutrient based. Two, you already need them anyway. And if we don't get enough, they're at least low hanging fruits to bump you in that right direction. And then everything else, find a good functional medicine doc if that's not getting you where you want to be to figure out the next steps. Well said. You mentioned the websites, but I'll mention them again. Justin and I work with people around the world. So if you do want to reach out, we can send lab tests to your door, except for blood. We send you to a local lab for that. But stool, urine, a lot of the functional testing we do, urine, uh, saliva, hormone testing, et cetera, that's all done at your house. So pretty awesome, pretty easy, and very effective. Far better than the standard of care you get done from your once-a-year blood work with your doctor or your once-a-year hormone check with the endocrinologist. This is far and above that. We're not saying ditch those people. We're saying we're just going to go beyond what they're doing. So if you want to reach out to Justin, justinhealth.com or me, evanbrand.com. We love helping people. We're super blessed. We've got really, really cool jobs because we send people back into the world feeling better. And if you want to change the world, the best way, in my opinion, is to help multiply ourselves. So I feel like we're pretty awesome. We put out good stuff to the world. So if we can help other people get their energy better, get their sleep better, help their relationships with their kids because now they have enough energy to play with their kids and now they've got enough energy to do the dishes so their wife's not complaining the dishes are piling up and then their marriage gets better because they're both sleeping better so they're not grumpy and we dialed in their diet so they're not hangry and having blood sugar crashes. Like All the stuff we're doing is making people better people and then those people are hopefully nicer and better to their people and then it just kind of spreads like a healthy virus. That's our goal. 100%. And if you guys love this information and you enjoy it, give us a thumbs up, share it with a friend or family member that's dealing with this problem. And then also, if you really enjoy it too, right below, there'll be a link to go write us a review. So if you go to justinhealth.com slash iTunes, and I imagine Evan probably has a similar link, evanbrand.com slash iTunes, that will show right up to our review pages and feel free and write us a great review. And if you want to give us the same review and just cut, copy and paste it to make it easier and just change the names. That's cool too. We know you guys are busy. We appreciate the review. We appreciate the feedback. And if you're a little bit overwhelmed, which is normal, we're still here for you as well. And we'll put the contact info below. Hey, Evan, today was a phenomenal podcast. Anything else you want to leave the listeners with? This was fun. I would just say pick a step and start there and don't give up. This is a fixable problem. Absolutely. Also, I'm having my uh, second son this Friday. So really excited. His name's going to be Hudson. So we're really, really excited about that, putting the name out there early. So keep your fingers crossed and probably won't be here next Monday, but the following Monday, I'll be back in the saddle. Right now I'll be Sounds having great. some late nights, but I got my adrenal support. I'll be all right. Oh man, I'm excited for you. Well, congratulations. I hope everything goes well. Hey Evan, thanks so much, man. It was great chatting. You have a great day. You too. Take care. Bye.